start it. Good morning and welcome to She's a Force of Nature. I'm Alyssa Yapel and I'm going to be helping to moderate today. So if you have any questions for our presenters later on, um, please ask us in the question, the Q&A box, um, and we will get to those questions as soon as we're able to. Um, I just wanted to let you know that um, if you love our She's a Force of Nature series, which I hope you do, we do have one more left this month. And that is going to be on the 29th, and we're going to be um, talking about women who rock, which is a little play on our geological survey um, division. So we have a geologist and a graphic designer from the Division of Geological Survey who will be joining us then, and that's on the 29th at 11 a.m. Um, today, as you know, we have um, our wildlife, our females in wildlife. So. Jasmine Grossnickel and Candy Klosterman are going to be presenting in just a bit, but I want to remind you about our other series going on um, with our naturalists. Tomorrow we have naturalists Jenny um, and Julie, and they're going to be teaching you how to spruce up your home tree or packages um, with gifts from Mother Nature. So it's a little DIY um, home decor webinar. So. Uh, hopefully you can join us then, and if you are a fan of birding, we have two awesome birding programs later this month, one on the 23rd, um, which is about winter birding, and then another one on the 30th, and that's all about eagles. Those are both at 10 a.m. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to my coworker, Katie Gerber, who's going to tell you a little bit about She's a Force of Nature, who is um, who helps put on, excuse me, who's going to tell you about the Natural Resource Women's Network, who is um, the group that helps put on She's a Force of Nature. Thanks, Alyssa. The Natural Resources Women's Network is a group of employees here at ODNR who have come together to provide networking and professional development opportunities for the women who already work here. Um, but we also focus on getting the word out to young women about all of the amazing career options ODNR has to offer. And you can go ahead, um, Katie, and get started with um, with introducing Jasmine and um, her interview. Okay. Hi, Jasmine. Um, the first question that we have for you is, what can you talk about for hours and what do you geek out over relating to natural resources? There's a lot. Um, I, I grew up hiking, camping, fishing. So there's definitely a lot of things that I enjoy about the outdoors. Obviously, it's what, it, what, it's what brought me here in this career, but probably one of the most passionate things that I'm about uh, is uh, is birding. I love to bird. Um, I like chasing down rare birds. Uh, so so I'm, I'm that person on eBird that's constantly checking what's been seen, what's going on. Uh, you mentioned the, the bald eagle uh, activities or pre presentation that's going to occur coming up. I'm a huge fan of uh, finding out where bald eagle nests are. I, I always tell people that uh, that it's always a good day when you see a bald eagle. We have several nests here in Miami County and, and I love seeing them soar around. So yes, definitely birding is kind of my little area that uh, that I can talk a while for. That's awesome. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have asked you initially, um, what's your hometown, your educational background and your responsibilities? Let us know a little bit about yourself. So my original hometown is in Montgomery County. Uh, I grew up outside of the little burg called Billsburg. Uh, from there, I went to Northmont High School or I was in the Northmont School District. Uh, spent a couple years at Sinclair Community College before uh, transferring to The Ohio State University and I'm a huge Buckeyes fan. So uh, I'll be, well, I'll be working next weekend, but I'll be hopefully tuning into the game. Uh, so uh, from uh, at Ohio State, I majored in uh, natural resources, uh, wildlife management, and uh, I didn't really know what I was 
going to do uh, when I first went to college. I thought that uh, that I would maybe work at a zoo was my first thought. Uh, I quickly learned that through my academic advisors that that may not be the best uh, career path for me to go into and learned a lot about wildlife management and just all the um, all the facets of it from wildlife surveys to how it can branch into law enforcement to um, just just everything that that is wildlife management and um, and really uh, started looking at careers and and in wildlife management after graduating. I've been in Miami County as a wildlife officer since 2007. So I have just over 14 years in uh, and uh, the majority of that time has been in Miami County. Initially, I didn't think I was going to go into law enforcement. It wasn't something that a lot of um, our other wildlife officers that they maybe have that interaction with a wildlife officer when they're young and they say, wow, that's the job that I want to do. I want to be that person enforcing wildlife law enforcement. For me, uh, it was something that I more uh, through job searching discovered uh, through and, and understanding that there's definitely a balance between wildlife management and the enforcement that goes behind it, that that's what drew me towards wildlife law and uh, and it, it, it works out very well. Where could we find you on a Saturday afternoon? Well, a lot of times it depends on whether there's an Ohio State game on or not. I, I won't lie about that, but <laughs> for the most part, especially actually during the fall, I'm out in the field. I'm, I'm in the field driving around. Uh, I'm in my truck right now. This, this is more or less my office. Uh, I do have a little bit of time that I spend um, more behind a desk where I'm doing paperwork, or writing reports. But for the most part, I am driving around. I'm looking for people hunting, fishing, and trapping is, is the primary goal of, uh, of my contacts that I'm trying to make as a wildlife officer. But uh, there's a lot of other stuff that we do. We, um, uh, as well as checking for license compliance, we also will do education events, um, such as today, talking about our career and what we do. But we'll also go to hunter education courses fishing derbies, uh, we'll do um, archery events, all sorts of shooting sport activities that we're really trying to educate people on what uh, what natural resources and the Division of Wildlife has to offer. And then uh, we'll also work a lot with um, people dealing with wildlife interaction and conflict. I get a ton of calls in the spring about people finding baby bunnies and what if anything they should do. So it's a, a matter of taking the time to really talk to people and understand what the concern is to, uh, to address how you can best help them. So many important duties as a part of your job. What's the most exciting project that you're working on right now? So right now we're wrapping up deer gun season or well deer gun season is over. We still have a lot of uh, deer enforcement yet to do. Um, so we're looking at a lot of that, of that harvest data, following up to see um, if there are any violations, contacting individuals, interviewing them. If, um, if there does happen to be something that, that needs to be addressed. So that's one of the main concerns this time of year. But one of the great things about being a wildlife officer is that the job is constantly changing depending on what season and what area you're in. So for instance, right now it's deer enforcement. We're going to roll around. Uh, I don't have um, I don't have a large body of water like Lake Erie to patrol, but our Lake Erie officers are going to be working ice fishing once uh, once Lake freeze is over. Hopefully, once Lake freeze is over. So there's a lot that we do in the spring. You're going to have the walleye run. Uh, you're going to have um, people out turkey hunting in the summer. It's it's more fishing. So the great thing about this job is that it, it never gets boring. You just constantly change it up and there's another season right around the corner. More things to look into, more people to contact and we're happy to uh, make those interactions. What do you enjoy most about the work that you do? So one thing I'm really passionate about um, that I mentioned briefly is the human um, wildlife interaction and conflict. I think that this is one way that we can really bridge the gap between your uh, traditional 
users, such as your hunter and trapper or, or angler, and uh, and then also your non-traditional users that may be going out bird watching or even just cleaning up the the um, their yard in the spring. I really think that it's important for us to reach out to contact these people or provide good information to them should they contact us to um, to really address any concerns that they have and inform them as to what wildlife is, how you can interact with wildlife responsibly and uh, and pass that along to other people. You certainly detailed your impact on the lives of Ohioans, but do you want to go into any more detail about that? Um, sure, I, I, I had to look at my my notes a little bit to see <laughs> all I wrote down. Uh, so yes, what, as a wildlife officer, like I said, it, we, we cover everywhere. We have authority to go on private and public land. Uh, so uh, a lot of people will oftentimes confuse us as park officers. I know that uh, in a previous series, you talked to one of the natural resources officers and we differ from uh, parks and watercraft or natural resources officers uh, in ways that uh, a lot of times they're restricted to waterways and, uh, and state property uh, or the state parks, whereas we go everywhere. Uh, I'm assigned to Miami County, but if there's a need for me to go up to work, Lake, to work Lake Erie, I'm more than happy to go up there, help them out and explore that region, get to know more people and uh, and really interact in those areas. So so it, it's it's a fascinating job that uh, there's only one officer per county. So at times it can be very hectic. Uh, however, uh, you know, there, there's other times that we get to work together. We work on projects. Uh, there's there's nighttime enforcement working for jack lighter shooting people shooting deer from the road at night. There's all sorts of activities that we do together that we work as a team uh, as well as individually to really get the job done. So Jasmine, how would you define a mentor? Can you talk about a time when a mentor was or would have been helpful to you? I think uh, I can't say that there's any one person that I look at as a mentor. I've definitely learned a lot from individuals and, and picked up uh, information from them throughout my career. I work with some great other officers and watching, you know, some of them maybe doing interview and interrogation and learning the little things that they do and able to get that bad guy to turn over or uh, or confess uh, what happened. I'm just at all in, in some of that. So so definitely a lot of my fellow officers are, are a great resource as far as just additional training and learning more to improve myself and, and my workability as well. Who to you is the most inspiring female role model or leader and why? I, I, I honestly, I don't, I, I can't say that I look at a lot of other people as role models. I, I, like I said, I, I, I pick up what other people are doing um, and try to just learn something from everyone. Everyone has something to teach us. Uh, even, I mean, I have a five-year-old daughter. I'm learning from her every single day. So, so I think that, that you can definitely pick up individual things from each person. I mean, obviously we have, we have a female chief and a, a female director right now of which they are very inspiring. They do great work. They're, they're wonderful women to look up to, but me personally, I, I don't actually really pull out role models, individual role models. I just try to learn off of each individual. I love that everyone's a role model. That's um, powerful. <laughs> so the last question here is what is one piece of advice that you would give to a young woman um, looking to pursue a career in the natural resources field? So in other words, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you were at that stage in your life? So if I look back at my career path, I spent five years doing seasonal work. Um, mainly bird research. I did some uh, bat research working for an environmental consulting firm. I didn't actually start working for the Division of Wildlife until shortly before becoming a wildlife officer, which I was doing quail covey count surveys as a natural resources worker. So I had a 
a pretty extensive uh, working knowledge as far as how seasonal jobs work and how difficult it can be to uh, to get that full time permanent position. And for me, like I said, it, law enforcement was not the direction that I thought I would go into. Um, so I would just say, don't be afraid to try something new. Step out of your norm. Uh, one of the things that really drew me to um, to being a wildlife officer, which let me say when I first applied, I knew very little as to what a wildlife officer actually does. Uh, I, I knew that there was a, that you had to have a fishing license since I grew up fishing. I knew that there was a person that checked that license and I knew that there was more to a wildlife officer, but really I didn't know a whole lot beyond that. So it was really through exploring the position, understanding um, that uh, how wildlife management and the importance of wildlife law coexist with each other and uh, and how one helps the other uh, and vice versa that uh, that I became interested in the law enforcement position. So with that, you know, don't be afraid to, to go outside of what you think you want to do uh, because really if I if I look back there, I still do a lot of wildlife management work. Like I said, I'm, I'm passionate about talking about human wildlife interaction. Uh, we're getting ready to do our midwinter waterfowl survey. Hands down, probably my favorite day of the entire season or year is when I get to get paid to look at birds. I mean, hello, that's awesome. So, so yes, there's there's a lot of stuff that we do that I still can um, put back to what my initial goals were when I graduated college. However, uh, there's also a lot that uh, that the law enforcement side, the, the whole cat and mouse game. That's fun. It's fun catching the bad guy. So, um, so yeah, I don't don't be afraid to break outside of the norm and go for something that maybe you didn't see yourself doing uh, at that time, but uh, ends up fitting perfectly for you. So, Jasmine, this is Alyssa. Um, we have a few questions that came in, and before we pass it over to Candy, I just wanted to ask you. Um, these questions from the viewers. So we had someone write in, what was helpful in training to meet the physical requirements when trying to become an officer? So to become a wildlife officer, the hiring process actually starts with a civil service exam. Uh, then there is a um, an interview process as well as a polygraph, a drug test and a physical fitness test and also a physical. Uh, to prepare for the physical fitness test, it's push-ups, sit-ups, and, and a mile and a half run. And the key is, is just to work your way up to any of those. We have to test every year to, um, to stay employed as a wildlife officer. So, so there is continual testing once you are already hiring. So it's important that you stay in shape to continue those uh, physical fitness activities to make sure that you're able to uh, to meet those levels. I can tell you that uh, that can I do the number of push-ups I need all year every day? Probably not, but a couple weeks before the test, I'm, I'm powering the push-ups out to, to build up my strength again for the test. Now, I would say that that's probably not the best training technique. What you should do is go to the gym or, or work out on your own, you know, multiple times throughout the week, eat healthy, stay healthy, Stay clean. Uh, um, make sure that the, that you don't have any um, any drug use, alcohol use, anything like that. That that's going to negatively affect your body. But uh, but just continue and, and keep on um, exercising. And uh, I know with the the mile run, when I was initially testing, uh, I I would start off you know with one lap um, around the track. That I would run one lap, walk one lap, and then. I just built on that until I was running the entire thing and able to uh, to pass the test at the level that needed to be done. Is there a time, um, a maximum time for the mile? Did you say mile and a half or mile? Yes, it, it's a mile and a half, and it is um, it is based off of age and gender. Okay. So, and uh, which I know that we do have the standards on the Division of Wildlife's website, so um, so anyone can check out that to. Uh, to see what those standards are and, and start working towards those levels. Okay, and I did post in the Q&A the link um, to the DNR wildlife officer 
career page with all of the details and whatnot um, for for these types of trainings. So um, another question. Uh, what was oh excuse me? How much time do you spend out on a boat, if at all? And would you what would you tell people who have motion sickness? Well, in in my job, I don't. Um, I lost your sound, but I see your mouth moving. So, <laughs> all right, I'm going to go ahead and answer that. So, and, and, and uh, as a wildlife officer and especially assigned to Miami County, I spend uh, pretty much no time on a boat. Uh, I have the Stillwater River and the Great Miami River that run through Miami County. So, so the need for a boat in this area, I've kayaked a couple times uh, enforcement wise, but other than that, I'm, I'm not on a boat. There are definitely state parks and, and reservoirs as well as Lake Erie that we do have uh, more of a presence on on waterways and um, and on uh, on boats. So it just depends on where you're going as far as if you are required or, or, or watercraft is needed um, as part of a tool of your job. But here in Miami County, I, I'd say I have little to no uh, boating need. Got it. And we did have one question, one other question, but you pretty much answered most of it. It um, was from Bethany. So thank you, Bethany, for your question um, asking what was the hiring and training process like? Um, I, I guess I'll just elaborate on that a little bit and ask um, the hiring process. Does that start when you apply or does that start much earlier on, potentially even when you're in high school, um, considering the background checks? Can you elaborate on that? Jasmine, and then we'll pass it to Candy. So as far as the hiring process, it's always good to have good practices when you um, when you're young. So definitely when you're talking about going into law enforcement, things that you do when you're younger can negatively impact your a career, your potential of getting a career later on. So in, in high school, you know, avoid drugs, avoid alcohol, watch what you're posting on social media. Uh, because that is there forever and can definitely be found and dug up and uh, used against you potentially uh, should there be something on there that's negative. So you do need to make sure that you check up on that type of stuff and really health and fitness starts at that young age too. So when you go to college and uh, you get around friends, make sure that you're maintaining those healthy habits that maybe you did in high school and uh, and continue those through to so then that way you're still in, in good physical shape that you don't have to necessarily train to prepare for the test. You're already ready for it. So that would be things before the hiring process, but then also um, so the minimum standards or qualifications would be you'd have to be 21 years of age or older to be a peace officer in Ohio. So you have to be at least 21 years old and then you have to have an associate's degree in um, in a related field such as criminal justice, natural resources, biology uh, some military time may transfer over as well to uh, to meet some of these requirements. So those are kind of the initial thing that you that you need. You also have to have a, a passion for the outdoors. Uh, it, it's impossible to do this job and not like the outdoors. You, you're in the elements. Uh, I'm a bit of a fair weather person myself, but when it's freezing cold and I have icicles forming on me, I'm not one that likes to go hiking too much, but sometimes the job requires it. You might be in muzzleloader season and there's a hunter incident that you have to investigate. So uh, so there's definitely um, a need or you need to be able to work outside in all types of conditions. Uh, we'll work fish kills when it's 100 degrees outside and uh, and you have to be prepared for that and, and, and be able to uh, to get through the good times as well as the bad when it comes to natural resources or the outdoors and and what the world uh, is and, and climate and everything like that. So so those are definitely things that you have to have you know before you even apply for it. But then there's a the civil service exam. And there's the uh, background investigation, the interview, the, the uh, physical fitness test, polygraph test, and um, a physical that also happens before you're hired. So the good news is, is once you get through all of that, then um, you are hired under a probationary period and you, um, the Division of Wildlife, if you don't have previous uh, law enforcement experience or you're not certified as an Ohio Peace Officer, 
then you um, the Division of Wildlife actually puts the probation, probationary officers um, through the academy. Uh, we're currently using the Ohio State Patrol Academy and uh, and that is 16 weeks. Uh, so you go through basic peace officer certification at that point at the police academy. Once you're done with that, then you have nine weeks of specialized wildlife and uh, law enforcement training because while it's good to know how to um, how to re write a, a, a traffic crash because you might do that on on a state property um, or, or some of the other stuff that regular or your uh, county or, or state wildlife or I'm sorry your state or um, county law enforcement officers may do it's also uh, that's not well we can do that those activities um, on state properties there's a lot of stuff that your regular law enforcement officer does not do that's more geared towards wildlife the hunter incidents the fish kills the uh, just contacting people in the field we're in a job where during hunting season everyone we come up on has a gun uh, so that is that's very different from from traditional law enforcement where you see a gun as a weapon and not a hunting implement so so there's a lot of training that goes into that as far as the correct approach reading people being able to talk to people and uh, and then best um, best serve people once we get out of the academy once you graduate then then there is actually six months of, uh, of being with field training officer to really make sure that that officer is prepared to make contacts and um, and be uh, out in the field by themselves because we are one person per county and uh, and we have to make sure that those officers are really prepared to handle that stress and uh, job load that, that we can sometimes have. Well, you were almost off the hook. I said that was the last question, but we had two, minute, two more come in. Um, so a couple more questions before we switch gears here. Um, Sarah writes, do you, uh, did you have an internship with ODNR and um, have you worked with interns in the past? And I'm going to put just a quick um, uh, PSA out there that we are currently hiring for interns. So if you're interested, visit careers.ohio.gov. You can find the application there or if you search in Google Ohio DNR um, interns, our internship page will come up and applications are open until December 20th. Um, so anyways, that was my little PSA. I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Jasmine, to answer. So as far as internships, no, I did not have one uh, through the department or the division. I, I did, it was actually once I was already starting the hiring process that I was the conservation worker um, out of Olin Tangy doing the quail cubby count surveys. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of experience with, uh, with the Division of Wildlife prior to, um, prior to applying to this. However, that being said, I would highly encourage anyone that's interested um, and becoming a wildlife officer to get involved with the agency, however possible, whether it be volunteering or seasonal positions or whatever may come up that uh, that it's very important to make those connections, uh, get your name out there, be known because typically when we're hiring for, acad for an academy, we're talking about maybe 20 people uh, and there's about a thousand people that apply for the position. So anything that you can do to um, to give you that edge um, and uh, and get your name out there, I, I very strongly encourage. And last question for real this time. Um, do you have any insights on older women getting into natural resources? Um, and I can't remember the age, but I think is Officer Baker, our oldest wildlife officer that got into the academy. Um, can you expand on that, Jasmine? Uh, I'm not sure as far as who our oldest officer is that, that's gotten hired or what their age was at the time. The main thing that's going to probably um, or potentially eliminate an older uh, person from getting this job is, is going to be the physical fitness requirements. Uh, and, and that's the key that if you're physically fit uh, and, and you meet all the requirements, then I, I don't believe that there's any age cap as far as, uh, as as far as getting 
this position. So it's just a matter of being able to um, to meet those requirements because there's definitely a lot of wisdom and experience that comes with the with older officers that are hired versus the younger ones. The minimum age is 21 just because that's what you have to be to be a peace officer in Ohio. But and, and we definitely have some very talented and, and smart young officers out there. However, you do notice with the older officers just more life experience. I mean, that that's huge. It's just life experience and, and being out and around people to so. So yes, I, I, I would encourage anyone older to go ahead and apply, apply to. It's just a matter of uh, being physically fit and uh, prepared for what the job has to offer. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, and if anybody has more questions, I think that um, Jasmine will be sticking around. So go ahead and use that Q&A box. But our next presenter is um, Candy Klosterman. She is a wildlife investigator. Um, so you're not going to see her face today. She is going to share her PowerPoint presentation though, and she has some awesome information to share with you all about um, her career and, and all that good stuff. So um, Candy, if you share your PowerPoint, I can put it up whenever you're ready. Okay, Alyssa. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yep. Okay, let me know when the PowerPoint is up. Okay. Sorry for all of you that have to just bear with me sitting here awkwardly in the meantime. <laughs> I don't see it yet. Have you shared it? I did. OK, stand by. OK. Can you see it yet? I cannot. OK. The box isn't popping up at the presenter mode at the bottom. Um, did you open share tray? Yes. Oh, here Let's it comes. This. Here it comes. OK, sending live now. OK, great. You're on. All right. Um, well, I'm, my name is Candy Klosterman and I'm an investigator with the Ohio Division of Wildlife. Um, I've been with the Division of Wildlife for 26 years now, and that is a long time, um, but it's a great career. And when you're thinking about your career, um, it's usually a 30 year career. So you want to ensure that it's something that you love doing. Um, and I'm going to go over a little bit of my history and my background and things like that, just so you know, um, what it takes to be even a wildlife officer and or investigator or work for the Department of Natural Resources. But all in all, it's a great career. Um, as far as my position now as an investigator, um, just to explain to you a little bit of the difference between the wildlife officer and the investigator. You just saw, um, probably watched Jasmine Gross Nichols um, presentation on the wildlife officer. So you kind of got an idea of what she does. Um, she's in uniform and she's on patrol. And I like to compare the investigator and the officer position kind of to like a, an investigator in a police de department as opposed to a, a police officer. The police officer is in uniform on patrol, uh, whereas the investigators are kind of working in the background. Uh, we don't typically wear uniforms. Every once in a while, while we are required to just because we wanna help our fellow wildlife officers out um, when we're short uh, on, on manpower. So we do every once in a while work in, work in a uniform. Um, so the way the divisional wildlife is made up, uh, we have five districts in, in uh, the state of Ohio, and I work at a wildlife district one, and that is the center uh, dot there in Franklin County. Now I work a 13 county area, but I can work anywhere in the state um, if needed and Lake Erie. So there's one officer per county in the in our 88 counties in the state of Ohio. And then we also have some units on Lake Erie who specifically patrol Lake Erie. Um, we also have our supervisors and our investigators assigned to each district. 
Now, the way the district is set up, um, depending on where you are, we, we usually have typically have two to three investigators in each district um, and we uh, typically work that 13 county area or the district we're assigned to. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my journey because I feel like uh, the journey is how I got here and I think it's important uh, to get the information out there so that those of you that might be interested in a uh, career with the Department of Natural Resources, um, you know, can see what it takes to get to where you want to be within the Department of Natural Resources. It's a very competitive, um, I guess, career. But even though it's competitive, it doesn't mean you can't do it. And that's why I want to share my journey with you. Um, I think that people, most people, when they ask me what I do and I tell them I work for the Division of Wildlife, they want to know, how did you get into wildlife? What, what took you there? And I have to go back to my grandparents. I have to go back to uh, my grandfather taking me fishing when I was five or six years old and, and a little 14-foot John boat that had a little tiny motor on it. I thought that was the best thing ever. Um, every morning we would get up and we'd go fishing together. And, and I'd also go with my dad and some of my other re relatives. But I think it's important where you start your journey and how, you know, how that brought me here. Just doing that has given me this great career. So um, a little more about my journey and where I'm from. Uh, I grew up in Salina, Ohio, and it's in Western Ohio, uh, and it's the home of Grand Lake St. Mary's. So while growing up in uh, Salina, uh, I graduated from high school in 1988, and during that time, I worked on a dairy farm. Uh, I worked on some hog farms, um, and with those, in those time periods, I uh, I discovered uh, with working with some of these farmers that they were also waterfowl hunters. So I started hunting when I was 16, um, and I would I would go hunting with them. We would take you know a day off work and um, just go out and, and waterfowl hunt. So on every opening day, so that's kind of where I got my start with um, being for the love of the outdoors and natural resources. But when I graduated high school, um, I, I knew I wanted to work outside. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do until I was checked by a wildlife officer when I was like 16 years old. And it's something that I really wanted to do. But after high school, um, my family members, most of them worked in factories. So I thought, well, that's, you know, that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. And so began my factory life. Um, so I worked at White Farm Equipment uh, with my dad and at the end of uh, 1988 after I graduated, uh, the first thing he did was brought me an application and said fill this out. And that's when adulting started. Um, I started working at White Farm Equipment and I was there from 1988 to 1990 and realized that that's not something that I wanted to do and realized that I was indoors the entire time. So when I would get home from work, I was either fishing or hunting. Uh, in those areas. I tried several different jobs, several different shifts, but it just didn't, you know, really pan out for me and I really wanted to work outside. So I quit my job in 1990 um, from the, the factory and I applied for Hawking College. It's a two-year school and I, I know it was a risk because the job I was working at the time was a great job at that time and I made good money and it had benefits, but I took that risk. And looking back at my 26 years, I, I, I still can't believe I am where I am today uh, with the Division of Wildlife, but this is where I got my start. And I'm hoping that my journey can help you um, to get to where you want to be and maybe get to where you want to be a little bit quicker. Like I said before, this is a competitive uh, field, but it's doable and it's possible. So I went to college. I graduated in 92. And after graduation, I thought, well, you know, I have a degree now, so I'm I'm sure I can get a job. Well, it took me some time. Uh, I then went to Ohio University for a year as I was doing some other odd jobs, working at a carry out, mowing grass. Um, I was a lawn maintenance supervisor uh, for this company in Athens. So I drove around and we would mow grass, different people's grass. And one of the places we mowed was the Department of Natural Resources, Division of Wildlife's District 4 office. So here I am, I'm working three jobs, I'm going to school. And uh, so one day I just, I went into the office and I walked down the hall and I talked to uh, one of the uh, employees there who was in wildlife management. And I walked in and I told him I wanted to be a wildlife officer. 
and initially he just he stared at me because he knows it's competitive. And this is also a male dominated field. So back in the 90s, you know, there weren't a lot of women in wildlife. And so he he did give me some direction. Um, he told me to call Wolf Creek Wildlife Area and talk to the area manager there and see if I could do some volunteer work. This isn't even paid stuff. This is volunteer. And I was willing to do that. So I did. I went up to Wolf Creek Wildlife Area and I talked to the area manager there, told him what I wanted to do. So he allowed he allowed me to volunteer at the wildlife area. So one of my first jobs um, was moving an outhouse from one of the camping areas with a backhoe. So I always like to tell this story because that's one of the first jobs that I volunteered to do for the Division of Wildlife and because I wanted this so bad. Um, so this led to uh, well, I also mowed grass and, and had to pick up trash and all those other things. But there were some rewarding experiences during that volunteer time and I encourage anyone that's in that wants to be uh, employed by ODNR or the Divisional Wildlife is to try those uh, volunteer opportunities. Not only is it, it's giving you experience, it makes you a more well-rounded individual. Um, so I, I definitely encourage you to start out, you know, if you just want to volunteer one day a week or something like that. But the volunteer work led to seasonal work, um, which led to part-time permanent work. And finally, in 1994 or five, I landed my first permanent job with the Division of Wildlife as a wildlife area technician. Um, it wasn't the wildlife officer position, but I still love what I did. Uh, I had the opportunities to assist in reintroducing the Eastern Wild Turkey. Uh, I had the opportunity to assist in reintroducing uh, the trumpeter swans. Um, and as you can see in some of these photos, um, you know, the goose roundups where we would round the geese up and put leg bands on them to kind of track their populations and, and monitor their um, migration patterns, as well as also duck trapping. So all this experience that I gained um, being in the wildlife management field, it helped me throughout my career. I learned a lot. And when we talk about mentors, mentors, um, I want to say the person at Wolf Creek Wildlife Area, he was one of my biggest mentors. And he also told me <laughs> it was, I really wanted a job with the Division of Wildlife. And one day he said to me, he said, Candy, you may get a job with us and you may never get a job with us. You know, but I took that, you may get a job with us and I ran with it. So um, I, I continued to think about that. And so I did do uh, some time in wildlife management and, and enjoyed that time. But when it came to the Wildlife Officer Academy and being a wildlife officer, that's what I ultimately wanted to do. That didn't come easy either. I applied three times and finally on the third time I was hired. So um, I gradu graduated the Wildlife Officer class in 1999. And as you can see in the article, um, Klosterman stands alone in Ohio. I was the only female uh, wildlife officer, field wildlife officer in the state. We did have one female education officer, but um, like I said, it is a male dominated field and, but we are um, evolving as an agency and I love to see it. And I, I think that she's a force of nature is a step in the right direction. Um, and hopefully those of you that are watching this, um, get something out of it and you can get to your destination a lot quicker than I did. Um, but there were barriers to break. There were naysayers and um, and you'll always have that. But you have to listen to yourself because this is you. This is your career and this is you know, ultimately you have to live with what you know this career for approximately 30 years. Um, so my first assignment uh, as a wildlife officer, I was assigned in District 1 at large, so I worked the 13 county area I am in now. I was then uh, transferred to Lucas County as a Lucas County wildlife officer, and um, most of the constituents, um, you know, we have a lot of male constituents out there too, and for them to see a female wi wildlife officer was, they might have been a little taken back by it. Um, there are more female wildlife officers out there now, and that's a good thing because we want to reflect our constituents and our constituents I have seen change over the last 26 years. I see a lot more women in the field um, fishing and hunting and I think that's that's wonderful and, and we as an agency need to reflect that. So I was in Lucas County and then a, an investigator position came up in Wildlife District 1. So I 
decided to apply for that investigator position. Um, this is some of the more long term stuff that I was talking to you guys about before. And as far as uh, the investigator position, um, I have been an investigator for the last 21 years now, so I've got to work on some of the largest um, cases in the Division of Wildlife history. I've had those opportunities. It's not that I have to do it. It's I want to do it and I get to do it. Um, some of the articles that you can see on the slides now are some of the cases that I've worked in the past. Um, these are these are very important cases. Um, as an investigator, we kind of, you know, we have the wildlife officer that's out front and I want to say they're, they're boots on the ground, but we, we're also boots on the ground, but we we're kind of a support system too for our officers. It's very important that our officers and investigators have a good relationship because the investigators don't get the information on these bad guys unless the officer presents it to the investigator. So we really rely on our wildlife officers in the field to collect that information and then we decide whether it's you know it's something that's going to be long term or short short term. Some of the investigations I work on are um, they can be anywhere from two to five years, two years for misdemeanors and five years for felonies. Um, and it takes a lot of patience in this position because you don't want the bad guy to think that he got one over on you and sometimes you want to rush right in. But I've learned through my experience that you just sit back and you just wait and you collect the information you need um, to prosecute that case. So some of the, ty the types of investigations that we work, um, our number one priority is our hunting incidents. And uh, those are some, can sometimes be very difficult. And I, I want to say that hunting is a safe sport, um, first and foremost, but we do have hunting incidents that occur in Ohio. And those incidents occur because somebody was probably doing something wrong and the incident could have been prevented, um, whether it be maybe they weren't someone wasn't wearing hunter orange and the other hunter didn't see him or her um, or um, they shot. They didn't look beyond their target and maybe they you know shot something they they shouldn't have, um, whether it be personal injury or property damage. So those are hunting incidents, number one priority. And I'm going to go over that a little bit in a little bit more detail and a, a little further in the pre presentation. OK, pollutions or wild animal kills. Those are also uh, our, our second priority within the Division of Wildlife. We want to keep our streams clean. We want to, you know, our keep our wildlife healthy that are in those streams. Um, and then we have also wildlife trafficking and or commercialization. And I'll go into that a little bit further, but these are kind of our top three priorities. Not that the others um, fall down the list and aren't important. They are very much important, but sometimes we have to juggle investigations and I like to compare it to um, a deck of cards. You know, whatever the priority is, is what we're going to be working and then something else may fall below, but we eventually we get to it. So our others include endangered species, which you might not you wouldn't think maybe we would would work that, but we do. We're a very diverse agency. Uh, anything from butterflies to reptiles and amphibians, um, you, you name it, we protect it. Uh, also reptiles and amphibians, uh, protection of our state properties. Uh, we have lots of acreage out there that we need to protect, um, whether it be from, you know, we have people going in there and dumping. Uh, we have dump sites, we have drug activity. Uh, you just never know what you're going to run into, but it's our responsibility as a division of wildlife to pre protect those properties so that the public can feel safe using them. Um, we also enforce hunting, trapping and fishing regulations as well as ginseng. So those are just some of the things uh, an investigator uh, would do, but I want to really prioritize or go over the, the investigator duties. So when I show up at a scene, uh, usually the officer, the wildlife officer shows up first because they there's one officer per county in the state of Ohio. So obviously they are. If I get a call to a certain county, the the wildlife officer is probably going to be there first. Um, but when I get there, if it's a pollution, a hunting incident uh, or anything like that, then the investigator becomes the lead worker or the officer in charge. And and what those response those responsibilities are is a coordinate coordinating your manpower or and or woman power. Um, you're delegating the duties to the officers and investigators, and this can be very stressful because you're arriving on scene and everyone knows more than you do. 
So you're getting a flood of information all at once and you're trying to figure it out as you go along. Um, we also gather intelligence. And when I was talking about a two year investigation, um, that's where the intelligence gathering comes in. Um, we usually have two years to um, prosecute misdemeanors, five years for felonies. So it's worth taking the time to do that. Uh, we maintain it in confidential informants. Just as you know, police departments have confidential informants maybe for the for drugs. We have confidential informants for people that are out there violating our wildlife uh, laws and they provide us good information and they're very important to us and we also have to protect them. So we have a big responsibility there. Uh, we conduct surveillance. Uh, we um, write and execute search warrants and we coordinate takes down and takedowns and debriefings on our bigger cases. Um, and usually the, the takedowns and debriefings have to do with the search warrant. That's probably something that we've worked, a case we've worked for a couple of years, and we know that the bad guy has the evidence in his house. And I'm not talking all, sometimes it could be one, you know, deer mount or something like that, but we've seized hundreds of pounds of meat and, and several deer mounts at the same time. Um, so those can get pretty big, just depends on uh, what the person is, what illegal activity the person is involved in. More investigator duties include um, collects and seizing evidence. Uh, report writing is a huge thing. You would, you might think that I'm in the field all the time, but a lot of times I find myself, depending on what type of investigation I'm working, I'm writing reports and those are important. They're important because we have to document everything that we do um, so that when we do go to court that um, we'll we have a successful prosecution. We conduct interviews with victims and suspects. Um, when I want to say victims, those are victims of hunter incidents. Those are victims of, let's say, uh, even a hunting without permission complaint. If somebody, uh, there's a hunter hunting on somebody's pr property without permission, that property owner is a victim. We have uh, the duty to uh, also, you know, protect their property and then also suspects. We prepare, prepare evidence for testing and analysis. Uh, we pho photograph evidence, issue summonses, and we file court documents and testify in court. And we also, I didn't really get to talk about training as far as investigator duties or are, are, are what our training is, but we do have specialized training once we um, become an investigator that we're required, we required to go through would include interview interrogation, um, death investigations, search warrants, and you know the list goes on uh, as far as training goes. So hunter incident investigations, I told you that these are our number one priority. So what would an investigator do if they were called to a hunting incident? Now you see several pictures in this slide and this picture all the way on the right is a, a gentleman that had shot his toe off because we have these self-inflicted incidents every once in a while because the, this guy apparently was trying to protect the barrel of his gun, so he rest from being in the mud, so he rested the barrel of the gun on his foot, shooting himself in the foot. So that's a, that's a hunter incident, um, and these are incidents that happen in the act of hunting. Um, so once an investigator learns of a hunting incident, we're going to, as I said before, we arrive at the scene and then the officer fills us in on what has happened. Sometimes the sheriff's officer also uh, come to those incidents and assist uh, us with those. But I think that I can say from my experience in 26 years that we are the experts when it comes to investigating um, hunting incidents. And usually a sheriff's department will either work with us and or give us the investigation. And we've had, we go through an academy also when you become an investigator to, uh, you go through a hunting incident investigation academy. So once you arrive at the, the hunting incident, what you want to do is lo locate any hunters, or anyone that might be involved and or the witnesses. Um, you have to determine uh, if there's a suspect um, and then where's the victim. These are difficult situations because um, people that hunt together are usually family members or friends. And sometimes it ends up, you know, one person, a family member may be shooting another person. Um, these are difficult situations for investigators because Ultimately, the person shooting didn't mean for that to happen. So we usually send one officer to the hospital to interview the victim and then one to interview the suspect. Those are the most difficult interviews to do because 
you have to sh you're showing empathy towards both parties, even though one is one that you consider a su suspect and one a victim. Um, so once you've determined kind of the scene and what's going on, um, you want to locate any evidence that might be out there and do the photography of the uh, photography of the evidence and then to collect the evidence. So we have some officers here in these photographs that are actually um, they're numbering the evidence and, and putting placards out and, and locating evidence. And then you see some bloody clothing up there. That's stuff that was probably at the hospital that we had to seize as evidence. Our second, um, um, the, the next thing is pollution investigations. So again, the investigators usually on, the officers on scene and the investigator shows up. So we're assessing what's going on here and a flood of information again is coming into us. So what we want to do in a pollution investigation, these are fish kills um, and sometimes they can be miles and miles long and it can be the heat of the summer and you're walking through a creek and that may be manure filled, who knows, with dead fish. So it's not the most pleasant thing uh, to have to do, but it, it is our job um, to protect our waterways. So once there you're attempting at to locate the pollutant, you want to know the source, is it industry, is it agriculture? Um, we have both that in our, our streams, um, so we want to find out where that source is so we can get it stopped. We also do field testing. We take water samples. Um, what we're testing for is the uh, oxygen levels and is there ammonia in the water? If there's ammonia in the water, then it, it means it's probably a manure spill. So that kind of helps us determine what the pollutant is. We want to determine where the pollutant entered the waterway. How long is the kill? Once we've determined how long the kill is, it's our responsibility to, we have to walk the entire length of the stream and identify the species of the fish that are dead and or wildlife, and then determine the, the size of the species also. And that will come into play uh, later on when it's the case is either prosecuted and or there's um, money paid to the Division of Wildlife for investigative costs. We also work, uh, I also get to work with the Environmental Crimes Task Force of Central Ohio, and it consists of the um, Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the United States Attorney's Office, um, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, a, a lot of agencies that get together um, to prevent these environmental crimes and or prosecute these environmental crimes. So it's an important task force to be a part of and we are, as a Division of Wildlife, are fortunate to be a part of that. We also have uh, commercialization in our wildlife trafficking in Ohio. And when most people think of wildlife trafficking or commercialization, they probably think of, uh, you know, ivory tusks or something from another country. But we also have our own wildlife trafficking right here in Ohio. Um, and most of the wildlife that is bought or sold in Ohio is deer, fish, or reptiles and amphibians. Um, deer is mostly the meat that is sold, and then we have fish, and then we have uh, for the pet trade is reptiles and amphibians. And there's been some large investigations um, that have been done in Ohio on these three species. So that's mostly what we work as far as trafficking in Ohio. Um, and most of the stuff is advertised through social media, and that's how we find out about it. And uh, there's a cyber crimes unit that actually monitors some of the stuff that's being sold out there. So, um, but these are things we can't work uh, in a uniform. And that's where the investigator in that plain clothes capacity has an advantage. Sometimes you have to dress like the bad guy, and that's where our advantage is. Um, so, uh, let's see here. This is one of the cases I worked. It was really, it was a long time ago, a long time ago, um, but it was probably 1230. It was, it was around midnight and obviously I was sleeping and I get a call from one of the local wildlife officers and this is Hoover Reservoir uh, here in central Ohio near Westerville. It's about two miles from my house. And so we get a call that somebody had set a gill net out um, from the bridge at uh, or the dam from Hoover Reservoir. Now a gill net is illegal in Ohio to possess. And so what basically happens with this net is the fish swim in and then if they try to back out, their gills get caught in this net. And you can see the net down there on the left. Um, that's me and another officer there um, 
assessing the, the situation here. Um, so again, we the net was out and we thought the people that were going to pull the net would probably be there at some point in the middle of the night. So I sat on the other side of uh, Hoover Reservoir and it was raining, raining, raining. Um, sat there for probably about three hours. I sat there in, in my rain gear and then I had two uniformed officers on the other side of the dam. Um, lo and behold, about 2.30 in the morning, uh, a couple of guys come running up over the top of the dam and they grab the net. And at that point, I called on the radio to my uniformed officers and they came screaming across the uh, the dam there. We ended up catching these two individuals who pulled the net out. And as you can see, those are the fish that they had taken out of Hoover Reservoir. Um, it's illegal to take fish that way. So what was their plan? Well, um, we, we had to investigate a little bit further. We found out that they worked at a restaurant uh, in Columbus here and uh, we found out where it was. So the next day I went and did an inspection at the restaurant of their freezers and lo and behold inside their freezers were uh, frozen. These are sawgai, uh, much like a walleye, um, frozen sawgai. So what were they doing with these fish? In any commercialization case, you have to think that if they're being paid money for these fish, they're going to go over their limit and they're going to do things illegally. That's why it's important for us to work these cases because they're taking away from those that are doing the right thing um, and they're not allowing that equal opportunity for our other constituents or our sportsmen and women that are out there. So these these cases are very important. And they catch a lot of news media and uh, the media is important to us. Um, as you can see in these headlines, these are all headlines that, you know, these are cases that we as the Divisional, Divisional Wildlife have made. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, with the media, it sends a message uh, stating if you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. Um, and I, I think the, the investigator job is very important to the Vi Divisional Wildlife in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, and it, it puts people or those poachers out there on alert that, you know, we, we are out there and, and we are watching sometimes when you don't know we are. So with that, uh, Alyssa, if you guys uh, need any um, career information, um, you can contact Jim Quinlivan. Um, he's the, in our Ohio Division of Wildlife Law Enforcement section, and he, there's his phone number, his email address, or you can go to wildohio.gov and type wildlife officer careers in the search box. And, and I just I put Jim's email address, address in the uh, yeah. chat, chat as well, as well in case anybody wants to click on that and email him directly. We do have a couple questions that came in and thank you so much for this presentation. It was awesome and I love your, your perseverance and resiliency that you talked about at the beginning and then the interesting investigation. Um, that was an awesome way to end it. <laughs> um, but we do have a, a couple questions. <clears throat> Della had asked, how long were you a wild officer before you came, became an investigator? Um, she also asked about an interesting or unusual case, but for the sake of time, I think we'll consider the Panda Inn to be our unusual or interesting case for this question, if that's all right. Okay, um, I was, I'm sorry there, can you still hear me? Yeah. OK, yeah, I was an, a wildlife officer for uh, approximately two and a half years be, before I became uh, a wild or a, wild, a wildlife investigator. So um, there's no set amount of time like that. You have to be a wildlife officer to be an investigator, but I can tell you I learned from the ground up. <laughs> when I became an investigator, I learned a lot from my mentors um, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but I did have some life experience coming into it, but I did have to learn a lot along the way when I first became an investigator. And that kind of answers um, our next question, but I'll ask it just for the sake of clarity. Um, is it possible to become an investigator without first becoming an officer? No, you must first become a wildlife officer before you can become an investigator. Um, I had to go through the the Wildlife Officer Academy and I had to be a wildlife officer and go through all the training as a wildlife officer does before I could be an investigator. So you have to be a wildlife officer before you can be an investigator. 
Awesome. And one last question before we wrap up today. <clears throat> Did you feel that you had to work harder than your male colleagues to get where you are? Um, go ahead. OK, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> and I'd love to answer it. And I have to say yes. Um, I, I think that it, like I said before, being the only female field officer coming out of the academy, um, I felt like you know there were naysayers out there. There were there were people out there that um, wondered if I could do the job, and but I have to say I had a lot of support uh, from other officers, and that's what got me through and where I am today. I have lots of brothers now that I never had. And it's it's a family and uh, I encourage anyone. I mean, if you want a career in natural resources, this is the family to come to. Awesome, that's a great note to end on. Thank you to both of our presenters. Thank you to Katie um, and then also Jackie, who is behind the scenes as well, helping out today. Um, we will be back, um, like I said, towards the end of the month on the 29th at 11 a.m. Um, to talk with our folks from the Division of Geological Survey. Thanks to those of you who joined us today. And if you missed anything and want to go back and watch, this will be posted on our YouTube page. So just go to YouTube and search Ohio DNR and you can find all of our recorded webinars there. Have a great one. Bye.